And this is the program that I developed. It's called Cultivating Mindfulness-Based Resilience. Now, I purposely use Wonder Woman as an icon, which is like a, a, a sort of a motivating superhero. So we use that for the women prison. And for the men's prison, I use Spider-Man. So it kind of uh, is kind of motivating to them to, to be able to have these role models. And they are wholesome role models. These are not, uh, these are not uh, superhero that kill criminals. I mean, no, no killing. So the, they, they become very motivating for the prison inmates. So one of the things we have to recognize is how, what they are going through. In the prison, the, in fact, the most severely stressed and hurting and suffering people in the world are those in the prisons. Fortunately, in the Philippines, they have a very positive culture towards treating prisoners. They don't call them convicts. They don't call them prisoners. They sometimes use the word inmates, but they actually use the term persons deprived of liberty, PDL. So they commonly refer to them as PDL. So it's a very, uh, a very positive terminology to use to, to refer to the, to the inmates, okay? Instead of calling them convicts, prisoners, and things like that. So these are persons deprived of liberty, PDLs. And you can see they were deprived of liberty. They don't even have basic hygiene uh, material or necessities. And facing the same wall day in and day out, not knowing when they will be released because there the release system is not well managed. A person may be sentenced to serve, say, 10 years, but could still be in there 20 years later. There are many I, I come across who have been in there for more than 10 years. Some of them even say to me that their sentence was only five years. So, it, so the management of release is very poor. So facing adverse series, because in the prison, you know, people quarrel. And uh, I don't mean anything, but especially in the women's prison. So the women have a lot of quarrels amongst each other. Imagine every day you wake up, that very person you dislike or who dislikes you and gives you a lot of trouble, every morning you wake up and you come face to face with that person over and over again. You have no chance of avoiding such a person. So it's a very, very painful emotional experience facing these adversaries day in and day out. And of course, they were bullied, despised and deprived. Okay, so constantly these inmates or persons deprived of liberty are experiencing anger, fear, frustration, anxiety, trauma, regrets, uncertainties, endless amount of uh, emotional disturbances that they experience. So it was very important for me to, to actually do a proper study how I can help them. And uh, of course, in the psychotherapeutic community, we recognize that generally circumstances around us that cause suffering, we can categorize them into three major categories without breaking down into too much detail. The first is something that arouses emotions, you know, and this makes people very emotional, something that arouses emotions. Uh, encountering people who are not kind to you making you and bullying you, that's a kind of you know, emotional arousal, hurting and causing a lot of fear, anger, anxiety. So the first, we call it traumatic experiences, experiencing emotional arousal, very deep emotional arousal. The second category of things happening around us that cause people to suffer a lot are adversities, things going wrong, presenting threats and conflicts in their environment. So encountering all kinds of problems and difficulties and troubles, uh, obstructions and things that are, that are not according to what you want. And we know that because when the Buddha spoke about the Four Noble Truths, all this was explained in the Four Noble Truths, that we are experiencing things not according to what we want. And the things that we like, we can no longer keep them because everything is impermanent and so on. So adversities, threats and conflicts is the second category. And the third category is anicca, impermanence, uncertainties. In real life, things can never remain unchanged. Things are always changing. Unfamiliar, unexpected circumstances, 
changes, perplexity, confusion, and all kinds of things, even boredom, because they experience a lot of boredom. You, you know, you can't get yourself motivated to do many other things when you're stuck inside the prison. There is not much choice you can do. The first category is very emotional, right? That's emotional trauma. The second category affects their physical well-being, their existence, existential. So that's physio physiological or existential. And finally, the third category is psychological. Now, if they are facing this day in and day out, they must be hurting. And then it leads to terrible things happening to them. They fall into depression. They experience post-traumatic stress disorder, all kinds of psychological disorder, or even the body becoming unhealthy, chronic illnesses and health issues arising. So having considered all that, I started to figure out what is it, how is it that I can help them. So I, it so happened that I have a background of various tools I can use. But the primary source of teaching, the primary source of inspiration come from the Buddha Dharma. I will show you later on how I transform Buddha Dharma into secular training that they don't recognize comes from the Buddha, but it is actually teachings of the Buddha. So the foundation of the exercises are based on metta meditation, the, then the mindfulness meditation, satipatthana, and also breathing, uh, mindfulness of breathing, anapanasati meditations. So I use this as a very important part of the tools and mainly focusing on exercises, not so much talking, 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 because that's not what they want to hear. They also have their own internal reformation program where they bring in lecturers who talk to them all day long, a lot of talking, talking, talking. So they don't want that. So giving them exercises help. And it so happened, I was very fortunate to be blessed with the uh, learning laughter yoga and that helps. Infusing every exercise with some kind of laughter that made a big difference. The whole primary purpose of all these exercises was to help them cultivate healthy body and a peaceful mind, caring heart, and motivated spirit. It wasn't just, it wasn't trying to convert them into Buddhists or anything like that. It was basically making them feel good about themselves. If they can feel good, they can think good. If they can think good, they can speak good. And if they can speak good, they can do good. So this is really the, the basis behind that. And I was very fortunate to personally come from a background with very helpful tools. Besides Buddha Dharma, I'm also trained in neuro-linguistic programming, NLP, and that helps a lot. And also clinical hypnotherapy, and that is also extremely helpful. And also as elements of cognitive behavior therapy, CBT. And finally, infusing everything we do with laughter yoga. Because laughter is the fastest way to bring someone out of a depressive mood. You know, when a person is depressed, you can say anything you like. And the last thing you should say to the person is, don't feel like that. Lah. That's not what you say to a person who is depressed. It doesn't work. You must say something funny or must get them to do an exercise that make them laugh. So that actually takes them out of that depressive mood very quickly. And also, we also infuse learning. You know, one of the ways to reform people, one of the ways to rehabilitate them is to actually teach them about loving kindness. Not only just towards others, but towards themselves. Love yourself. That was the main thing. And teach them metta. And, I was, and of course, it so happened that M-E-T-T-A, metta, turns out to be a beautiful acronym that can be used to describe the process of metta. Magnanimous. Magnanimous means open-hearted, generous, right? So that's what metta is about. Empathetic, understanding what other people are going through. Even understanding what you yourself are going through. That is empath empathy, empathetic, understanding that. And being thoughtful and tender in our actions. So that is really loving kindness in practice. And finally, uh, giving up self-centeredness, altruism, altruistic. So if you look at META as an acronym, M-E-T-T-A, it turns out to be a very beautiful acronym to mean magnanimous, empathetic, thoughtful, tender, and altruistic. You know, and this is the kind of things I was grooming into them to realize we're not talking about loving kindness, we're not talking about compassion, we are talking about simply 
to be open-hearted, general, uh, generous, to be empathetic, to be thoughtful and tender, and to let go the self-centeredness. And the program is called Mindfulness-Based Resilience, where we train them on cultivating mental toughness and mental agility, flexible mind, not just hard mind, you know. And this will help them to give them the ability to recover quickly and adapt easily to traumatic experiences, adversities, and uncertainties. So this is really the gist of this program, Cultivating Mindfulness-Based Resilience. So I'll quickly just share with you what it really means in terms of mental toughness and mental agility. You, you need, the mind needs to be strong, no doubt, but it also needs to be flexible. So the first part is mental toughness, tr training them to learn how to withstand problems, be able to recover from it. It is the mental strength that help people to recover very quickly from stressful situations, right? And you can say mental toughness, recovery, is like a person walking in an area where it's very uh, dirty and a lot of potholes, trip over and fall down. So the thing you need to do is learn to get up. That is recovery. So they learn to get up and brush themselves. So that is the mental toughness. And then so that they can carry on, continue and recover from that. But recovery alone is not enough. They need to learn how to withstand it in future. So we train them on mental agility. And this is really the, the flexibility of the mind, the agility of the mind, so that they can learn to adjust themselves, maneuver around the problem, and not the next time they go through that same, same muddy and pothole place, Recording they will learn how to walk breath. around it and not trip over and fall over all the time. So that is actually adapting, learning how to adapt. So to be smarter and better at adapting to their circumstances. So these are the two areas of focusing, the ability to recover and the ability to adapt. So it's recover quickly, adapt easily to traumatic experiences, to adversities, threats and conflicts, and to uncertainties. Now this ability to recover and adapt we recognize that a lot of it is because of the mind getting too emotional. So I use one of the sutra that was translated by my teacher, Bhante Punaji, where the Buddha stated, and this is in the Chitta Sutra, where the Buddha stated, emotions dominate the world. Emotions create distress, that means mental suffering. Emotion is that one thing to which all are spellbound. We are trapped. Once we allow emotion to appear and take over, we are caught. We, it's very hard to get out of it when we become emotional. Think about it. When was the last time you got very emotional? Were you able to get out of it quickly? No, you, you normally you would be caught in that emotional state for a while before you were able to get out of it. And that's why people get spellbound. And recognizing that, I started to then explain to the prison inmates in a secular manner without mentioning this sutra. Now, when I show you this sutra, I'm just showing you the basis from which I use the inspirational material. I never talk about sutras to the, the inmates. This is not mentioned to them. What is mentioned to them is this next part. I explain to them, we all experience vicious cycle of emotions. By the way, what I'm showing here is not only good for the inmates, it's good for all of us to understand. This is what all of us are going through every day. Things happening around us, we experience them. And our five senses help us to, our six senses altogether, help us to experience things happening around us. That is called Panchakanda, the five aggregates. We're experiencing all that, and then the mind begins to form impressions, right? And in this case, if we were to sense it is something emotional, traumatic experience, or if it is something, something going wrong, adversities, threats and conflicts, or if it is uncertainties, the mind then goes into a, a stressful state and causes the whole body to go into stress. So experiencing body discomfort and also mental disturbance. This is what we normally experience. And 
When that happens, it triggers an emotional chain reaction, making us feeling very sad and, and experiencing all kinds of deep emotional states and depression and all that. Anger, hatred, fear, and so on. And if we don't learn to overcome this, it gets out of control. And then we fall into these deep depressive states, right? Where we feed our emotions with all kinds of crazy thinking. That's called men mental proliferation. If we get emotional and if we don't learn to come out of that emotional state, the emotions trigger all kinds of crazy thinking. And then the mind is beyond control already. You gotta do something to help the mind calm down. So when it reaches that state, people will be experiencing depression, post-traumatic disorder, psychological disorder, chronic illnesses, and health issues. So this is really what every one of us is going through. This is dukkha. All of us are experiencing this kind of dukkha because the mind interprets our circumstances to be emotional, traumatic, or to present itself as some kind of advers adversity and, and threats or conflicts or uncertainty, not knowing what's gonna happen next. So that is really what is hurting us. So to help people uh, overcome that, to, to try to at least relieve them of all that suffering, I developed a program of four stages of exercises. It just so happened that these four stages of exercises begin with an R. So we, we need to help people to come out of that stress and, and trauma. So the first R, of course, is to learn to relax. So the moment people become stressed, if they learn to relax, the first thing that is happening is they prevent the stress from getting out of control. So this is a very important advice. Whenever we experience something that, that makes us feel very stressed, the first thing you must learn to do, relax. And this can prevent stress from getting out of control, preventing more stress from happening. But that's not enough because the moment stress happens, the body is flooded with stress hormone. So various parts of the body is still a little bit tense. Even though you're trying to relax, some part of your body is tense. You know that, you experience that. When you are experiencing stress, you try to relax, you still feel some parts of your body very, very tense. So we use a second R called relief. Consciously focus on other parts of the body that are feeling tense and just release the muscle tension consciously. So remember that relaxing alone is not enough. The next time you get stressed, you relax and then you must focus and scan your body, which part of your body is still tense. Your neck is still tense, consciously release. I'll show you some exercise where we use tension, relaxation to release them. Because if the part of the, the muscle is all tensed up, you cannot just quickly release it, you can't. So the, the technique I use is tension relaxation. That means you tense it and then let it go. By doing that, it's like a, a, a bottle of, of, let's say, jam. Very hard to open, right? If you just try to turn it, very hard. So you need that sudden jerk, right? And that's really what we need to do to the mind. Realize that parts of the body is still very tense. You need to tense it a bit and then only let go. So that is one of the technique that help them release stress tensions from other parts of the body. Now these two, first two are basically very much focused on the body. Now we need to do something about the mind. And this is where the Anapanasati meditation comes in. We also do variations of mindfulness of breathing. So by doing breathing exercises, it calms the mind. It calms the mind of emotional arousal. And this is a very important part. Now, the, every time I go in to do these programs, I'm only given two hours. I used to be given three hours, but the, the, the inmates were saying it's a bit long and then they get tired after three hours. So we, we trimmed it to two hours. But two hours is not enough to go through everything. So this first part, basically, we call it level one. So all the, all the inmates, they go through two uh, two seminars. The first one is level one, which focuses on these three. And then the fourth R is resilience, how we can train their mind 
to be tough and agile at the same time. So that will be level two. I'll talk about that a little later. But for now, we'll just take a quick look at the level one. Remember, these are four R. First is relax, and then relieve, and then recover, okay? So the first part, relax part, I simplify the technique of relaxation by telling them that you must be kind to yourself. So I call this the three-step self-compassion. So basically what, what, it, what it is is that three-step. When something happens that make you very stressed, pause, don't react to it, just pause for a moment. And then uh, realize that at that moment in time when you are stressed, Hormones is flooding through your body and various parts of your body is getting emotionally excited. So by pausing, you allow the emotional excitement to subside, to calm down. You also allow your experience of anxiety to subside and calm down. And also give time for the hormones to gradually subside and dissipate. But it is a very slow process if you just pause. So now you need conscious relaxation and do things to make yourself more physically relaxed. So the second part, we do a lot of breathing, deep breathing, and that helps to relax the body and compose the mind. So once you are able to pause and not react to any stressful circumstances, and then consciously relaxing the body, composing the mind, now you're able to focus on what can you do to help yourself overcome the problem purposefully focus on wholesome and beneficial solution or response to the problem. And this is the three-step self-compassion. So we teach them that every time something makes you stress, pause, don't react, take a deep breath, relax a little. And when you are calm and relaxed, then think, ah, what can I do to overcome it? Okay. And this thinking part, again, I draw inspiration from the first two verses of Dhammapada. And we all know many of us who attend Dharma talks, you would be very familiar. Mano Pubangama Dhamma. Okay? The mind basically creates everything. So in this case, Bhante uh, has explained that Mano Pubangama Dhamma is referring to the thinking mind, not the emotional mind. It's the thinking mind, cognition. That thinking mind precedes all our experiences. If we think good, we feel good. We think negative things, we feel bad. So it predominates and creates our reality. And if we were to think with vicious thought and speak and act with vicious thought, we will experience suffering. We cause suffering to ourselves and to other people. Just like the way the, the, the carriage follows the cow that is drawing it. And the second verse, if we were to think good with virtuous thoughts and uh, when we speak or act, then we will experience happiness. And that happiness is like the shadow that never leaves us. So this is really the first two verse that I drew inspiration from. Of course, as I mentioned before, I can't then go to the inmates and say, now let's listen to Dhammapada verse one, verse two. I can't do that. And for, so happened, psychologists, I purposely did a lot of research. There are many psychologists or famous people who have actually some sayings that basically reflect exactly what the Buddha was teaching. And one of the best ones came from this psych uh, psychiatrist, Viktor Frankl, who wrote the book, A Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, you know, very good book. And he said very clearly, he says, when we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. So I got all the image to recognize that and use that as a mantra. When you are no longer able to change the situation, you are challenged to change yourself, change the way you think, change the way you feel. And I get them to recite it over and over again, especially this bottom part. If it is to be, it is up to me. In other words, if you really want to experience peace, comfort and happiness, you really have to do something about it. If it is to be, it is up to me. And this is the mantra I get them to repeat themselves. So if they are able to repeat this and remember this, then at least in their times of suffering, they will realize, ah, they got to do something about it. At least we have some hope. So let's see what happens when they begin to do this and when they experience this vicious cycle of emotions. 
and the body is all tensed up, the mind is, is now all disturbed, the important thing is to get them to, to figure out, right? Don't react right away. Learn to pause and relax and think and not react. So this is the part where they have to realize that the way we interpret our circumstances, the way we perceive what's going on is causing a lot of suffering because we interpret it as trauma, traumatic experience. We interpret it as some kind of adversities, threats or conflicts. We interpret it as some kind of uncertainties, creating a lot of confusions and so on. We got to learn to pause, relax and think. So if they are able to pause, relax and think without interpreting everything like that and, and reacting to it, then they can stay calm. So this, this is the process where if you begin to pause, relax and think, and think happens to be a very helpful acronym. I, I love to, to use words for acronym because it helps people to learn and remember. T-H-I-N-K, truthful, helpful, improving, necessary and kind. You know, it's, it's a beautiful acronym. So that's the kind of thoughts they should carry. And if they can do that, they can actually relax the body. And now the body becomes more relaxed. They experience bodily comfort, relaxation of the body. They experience composed mind, mindful, um, the, the mental calmness, because they are now emotionally composed, not emotionally disturbed, okay? And when that is happening, then we transform this vicious cycle of emotions into virtuous cycle of composure. And therefore they, and this is the chart I actually go through with them so that they can understand what happens if they don't learn to pause and relax. And then it can help them to cultivate mindful resiliency, mindfulness-based resilience. Bringing your attention inwards and observing how you're affected by a problem, that is the practice of mindfulness really. Mindfulness is not just talking about, oh, observe what's going on outside, that doesn't help. You must observe how things that are happening outside, how it affects you inside. And if you can observe that and learn to take control of that, then you are able to change yourself. And this is the main message I get to them. And the exercises that helps them to cultivate this is those four R, relax, relief, recover, and resilience. And if, they can able to, if they're able to do that, it helps them to cultivate mental toughness and agility, to recover quickly and adapt easily. And if they are doing that, this is really called mindfulness-based resilience, helping them to cultivate healthy body, peaceful mind, caring heart, and motivated spirit. And you can see when I get them to do these exercises in the prison, suffering, look at their faces now after doing the exercises. Every one of them so happy, feeling good. If they feel good about themselves, they will be able to, to help themselves to be rehabilitated right? uh, and, and to be reformed. So you can see how happy they are when they go through these exercises. And I also teach them uh, a technique of, of breathing, mindfulness of breathing, that is beyond just sitting there observing your breath. Intentionally slow down your breath and that helps. Not trying, not with big effort, just allow your breathing to flow slower. And this is a helpful technique for every one of us. When you experience stress, one of the things you can do to relax is to just simply allow, not force it, not use effort, just allow your breathing to slow down. So consciously allowing breathing to slow down, and this helps us to relax the body and calm the mind without exerting effort, using allowing, just let it flow and just allow it to flow longer with each breath. So LSD means long, slow, and deep. Start with long, so allow the breathing to flow a little longer. And once it starts to flow a little longer, then consciously focus on allowing it to slow down even further. And normally each in-breath take about five seconds. Out-breath also five seconds. So when you can do that, your body comes down very quickly. So these are the techniques that I, I get them to do 
learn how to do LSD breathing, long, slow, deep breathing. And then I also collect a lot of materials from research to show them. And this is what one of the wonderful people, Dr. Herbert Benson, he developed what is called the two-step relaxation response based on very extensive research into meditation and meditative practices. And he came up with a very simple solution called the two-step relaxation response. Using modern technology, Benson is trying to understand how meditation appears to reverse the body's natural stress response. What we are finding is that for centuries upon centuries, people had discovered that there's something they could do to counteract the harmful effects of stress. Benson named it the relaxation response. It's the body's innate ability to lower blood pressure, reduce heart rate, and slow breathing. We are fortunate that we have within us a response opposite to the fight or flight response. That is the relaxation response. And there are scores of techniques. But in all of them, two steps are needed. The first is a repetition, a word, a sound, a movement. The second is freeing your mind of thought by concentrating on that repetition. And everyone can do it. The relaxation response can be triggered by all kinds of activity. From the repetition of a prayer, to the primal beat of dancing. Even the rhythm of exercise can reverse the harmful effects of stress. Even the rhythm of exercise can reduce the harmful effects of stress. So sometimes if you're feeling very stressed, one of the things you can do is go and do some exercises, play some games, right? play some basketball or whatever, volleyball or table tennis or anything, then you become more relaxed. Okay? So he mentioned two-step relaxation response. Number one, repetitive flowing rhythmic activity, like what we did just now. We sit there, allow the breathing to slow down, and that is a rhythmic activity. That is a repetitive, rhythmic, flowing activity. As we do that, we concentrate on the breathing. So in this case, whatever you do, you can concentrate on it. There are many things you can do. You can also chant a prayer. If you know of a prayer that helps you relax, so the Lord's Prayer, right? Uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, and so on. Okay? You can chant those if it makes you feel good, feel relaxed. Or any other prayer. Or you can have a mantra, certain chanting or certain words you can use. Right? In my case, I use the word Om. You try that. I want you to make the Om sound very deep inside you. Okay? Om. Do that. Om. Make the sound rhythm resonate in your nose. Om. Like you feel a little bit liquid in your nose. That actually makes you very relaxed. Okay, you do it with your eyes closed. Close your eyes and then make the sound on for a long time. Ready? Go. Om. And then observe how you feel. One more time. Om. And this is one of the things we can do. Om is a very good word. A lot of people do that in India, for example, they do that. That the resonance of the mm, make the whole body very relaxed. Okay, so that is a mantra. You can also have other sounds. You can play music, soft music. Not the, not the heavy music, huh? soft music. Or you do exercises, or you do movement, like what we're going to do later. Okay? Focus your mind on what you're doing. When you do that, it frees your mind from thinking about the problem. It frees your mind from disturbing thoughts. But we cannot always control the mind. Sometimes disturbing thoughts will pop up. Okay? So sometimes disturbing thoughts will rise up. 
Now, if you notice, when you're trying to relax, and then the mind starts to think about yesterday's problem, or the mind starts to become worried and fearful of tomorrow, what's going to happen? Learn to let go. So when you notice these thoughts rising in your mind, disturbing you, what you should say, do is, you use that attitude, ah, well, never mind. You use it with one hand to brush it away. Let's do that. Ah, well, never mind. So if something makes you feel bad, ah, well, never mind. Like for example, if there's a glass on the table, Somebody knocking and then the glass falls down on the floor. You know, wow. So when the glass falls down on the floor like that, what do most people do? Ah! No! When you see the glass fall down on the floor, yeah! you say, ah, well, never mind. And then you pick it up and pick it up. You know? Then you feel more relaxed. You feel good. You know? But you have to Careful. If something happens and nobody can hurt, it's okay to say, ah, well, never mind. But if somebody walking, walking, fall down and throw it on the head, don't say, ah, well, never mind, no good. <laughs> what you should do when somebody and then fall down on the head, quickly help the person to get up. After the person get up and sit down, take a deep breath, then you say, ah, well, Ah, if somebody get hurt, don't say, ah, oh, well, never mind. You do it. Help the per Number one, help the person first. Number two, take a deep breath. After that, number three, ah, oh, well, never mind. I use one hand. Ah, oh, well, never mind. Or if somebody out there, very jealous of you because you attend this class and they say, oh, they're jealous. And then they start to say bad things to you. Never mind. Just look at them and say, Ah, oh, well, never mind. You know? And then they get more angry. Never mind. That's their problem. Not your problem. You are relaxed. So always, if something goes wrong, nobody get hurt. Ah, oh, well, never mind. That's good? It's very important that every time we do something for them, we actually get them involved with it and get them excited about it. Just talking, talking, telling them, that doesn't help. Give them examples that make them you know, laugh a bit and stuff like that. Laughter helps a lot. Now, Herbert Benson came up with this two-step relaxation response. Step one basically, he says, is do things that are repetitive or flowing, that helps. So mindfulness of breathing meditation is a repetitive and flowing activity, right? So basically that's one of them. Other things like chanting. Now uh, in, Buddhist, in Buddhism, we would chant things like Om Mani Padme Hom, some of us. <clears throat> but the Catholics, of course, don't have that kind of chant. And they, that's why in the beginning I told them, oh, you can also chant your own prayers, right? the, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know, I was a Christian many years ago, so I rem remember these chants. So happened that it, it helped a bit. With, with knowing that, I, it helps a lot. And that actually is a very helpful, peaceful chant for the Christians, this Lord's Prayer. And there are also other things, some techniques, some, some things like Om. You know, you can try it yourself when you go Om and allow that re to resonate. It's very relaxing. So these are very simple techniques I teach them. And when we do these exercises, we focus fully on that. And by focusing fully on the exercises, in the same way when you do your meditation, your mind is very focused on mindfulness of breathing and very focused on, on body activity. If you're using, you are practicing Satipatthana or if you're practicing, practicing Anapanasati, you're very focused on mindfulness of breathing. So the, if the mind stays focused on the activity, the flowing rhythmic activity, then the, the mind will not be disturbed by various kinds of emotional thoughts arising. But then we can't always control the mind. Disruptive thoughts will pop up from time to time. And the technique I teach them is actually 
Whenever the mind is disturbed by these disruptive thoughts, just brush it away, learn to let it go. To say to people, oh, let go the thought. They don't know how. How do you let go the thought? So I give them the simple technique. When these thoughts arise and disturb you or something hurts you or whatever, just say, ah, well, never mind. And use the hand because there is this psychosomatic effect. When you use your hand to brush something away and say, ah, well, never mind. The movement of the hand actually causes the brain to copy it. And then because the brain is now dealing with the disruptive thoughts, the brushing away of the hand helps the brain to release that disruptive thoughts. This is a very powerful psychosomatic effect right, that uh, I learned in neuro-linguistic programming and also inside uh, clinical hypnotherapy. So these are very helpful, the psychosomatic effect. By using the hand to brush away something while saying, ah, well, never mind, and trying to let go the, the disruptive thoughts, you, it actually helps you to let go the disruptive thoughts, like freeing a butterfly and let it fly away. So this is a technique that all of us can use. Whenever you, you, you get, you remember yesterday's problems or tomorrow's worries and it's disturbing you and you want that thought to go away, by telling the thought to go away, it doesn't work. You cannot say, oh, thoughts, go away. It won't work. The more you fight it, the more it fights back. But if you just are very kind towards it and say, ah, well, never mind, and let it go, that movement also helps a lot. So this is a technique I hope all of you uh, can use right, when you are experiencing that. Never try to dwell on the thought or give attention to the disruptive thoughts. The more you think about these bad thoughts that pop up, the more you are reprogramming them into the neuron network connections. And then you, it becomes your memory. That's no good. So therefore, you must let it go. So don't dwell upon any disruptive thoughts or recalling these disruptive thoughts. Withdraw your attention with this, ah, well, never mind technique. So that is the first part, the relaxed part. Then comes the relief part. Oh, by the way, if you're interested, I will give you the link. You can download all these slides. I have uploaded it. So at the end of this presentation, you can just take a snapshot of the link and you can have all these slides. So the next part is relief. And I use progressive muscle relaxation to help people relieve the various parts of the body that's very tense. And this is a technique that all of you can also use. It's tension relaxation because like I mentioned before, when some parts of your body is so tense, the only way to relax is tense it and then let it go. Tense it and let it go, right? It's like the jerk you put onto the, 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 the jar of, of uh, jam you want to open. That jerk helps you to open the jar of jam. Same way, that tension and then letting it go, that helps a lot. So I developed a whole series of these progressive muscle relaxation exercises. One of them to, is to get them to stretch their body and tense it and then let it go. So they, they're very happy to do this kind of thing. And another one is the rowing boat and several others. I even get them to do the mouth, how to exercise the mouth as well. I'll just show you very quickly uh, a video how I presented these tension relaxation exercises.
That's why it's stuff like that that makes them feel so good afterwards, so relaxed, so happy. Their mood changed right, from depressive moods into a very happy, joyous mood. And you can see they all love to do it. And not, not only the women, but also at the men's prison, I was doing the same thing with those men. They also love it too. Even men love it too. So this is the second R, the relief part. Now comes the calming of the mind with recovery. The way to recover from stressful situation is to learn to calm your mind and to think more positively. So it's basically the art of letting go mentally, emotionally, right, psychologically, calming our emotions. So it's basically to help people to think good, speak good and do good. And if they can do that, then they are able to feel much better about themselves. And we know that because there is a very powerful sutra called the Veda Vitaka Sutra. This is a sutra where the Buddha spoke about the time before he became enlightened. And whenever he went through life, he was experiencing various kinds of thoughts prompting him to react in a certain way. So he was able to differentiate between two types of thoughts. Veda Vitaka Sutra simply means be able to differentiate two types of thoughts. That there are good thoughts and there are harmful thoughts. Learn to let go the harmful thoughts and only embrace or use the good thoughts to help you. So it's basically be able to differentiate what thought is helpful and embrace that. What thought is harmful, let it go. So this is Veda Vitaka Sutra in Majjhima Nikaya. But instead of doing Dharma talk, telling the inmates about Veda Vitaka Sutra, I took another uh, psychologist, William James, happened to say that the greatest weapon against stress is our ability to choose one thought over another. So helping them to figure out what thought is helpful uh, and what thought is harmful, they are able to choose. So I explained that quite uh, extensively using the pause, relax, and think, as well as the, the T-H-I-N-K as an acronym. Okay, moving on. Now we learn about recovery, the art of letting go, calming our emotions. Now this very famous psychologist, William James, he said very clearly, he says, the greatest weapon against stress is our ability to choose one thought over another. Because sometimes we have good thoughts. Sometimes we have bad thoughts. So choose good thoughts. Choose peaceful thoughts. Choose happy thoughts. Let go. Don't worry. Let it all go. Ah, well, never mind all the bad thoughts. I right? learned to let it go. So what are the three steps of compassion? Number one. Number two. Number three. Right. Think is a powerful acronym. Very useful. If you want to figure out, oh, what can I think? How can I think? Use E-H-I-N-K to guide you. E. E stands for what? Very important always. Think thoughtful thoughts. Okay? Don't think of bad thoughts. Don't think of thoughts that are wrong. Bad thoughts. Think thoughtful thoughts. H. H is also very important. Every thought you have, make sure it is helpful. Helpful. And when you have to work with people, I is also very important. Whatever you do with other people, make sure it will improve. Improve the situation, darling. Improve the situation. Oh, very darling. This group is good. I like. Yeah. Now, sometimes some some things are good to say, but some things you shouldn't say. So you have to be careful. Say it only if it is necessary. But finally, the last one is the most important and the most powerful. Whatever you think, whatever you speak, whatever you do, make sure it is nice. Very good, darling. Very good.
So every time they come across something that is good, I get them to go, very good, very good, yay, because it's really a, a reinforcement. It's a kind of reinforcement. This is good. This is great, you know. Because if you just tell people, oh, this is great, it won't sink in. But if they were to associate with an action of their own, very good, very good, yay, you know, that really helps to reprogram them. It's all part of a neuro-linguistic programming. So all these techniques are very, very useful for them, okay? So T-H-I-N-K is to think truthful, helpful, improving, necessary, and kind thoughts. Basically, they, they, people are trying to figure out, think, how do I think? Uh, what kind of thoughts are good for me? Well, this is the guide. If it is truthful, helpful, improving, necessary, and kind, that's the best thoughts you can have. The same with all of us. If we have to choose between two different types of thoughts, Veda, Vitaka, Santa, uh, Sutra, then we choose thoughts that are truthful, helpful, improving, necessary, and kind, okay? Not only that, now I get into the part where they are facing people who dislike them, people they dislike, people they have problems with, you know, people living in a community, 3,000 of them in the, behind the same fence. I mean, there's bound to be a lot of quarrels. There's bound to be people uh, having difficulty with one another. So I, I teach them how to deal with that. And of course, the basis or rather the source of inspiration came from Dhammapada verse 42, uh, also Bandipunaji's translation, where it says, whatever harm one enemy may do to another or one hater do to another, it is one's own ill-directed emotions that inflict upon oneself a greater harm. That means people may want to hurt you. People you may, may not like you or you may not like those people. But it is your own thinking, your own emotional thoughts arising that is actually hurting yourself more and more. Especially if it is something you keep reminding yourself very negative things. So this is something I, I get them to, to realize. That if they start to think negative thoughts, it will hurt them because it falls into mental proliferation where the mind goes crazy and begins to have all kinds of imagination and recalling all kinds of memory from the past that are unhelpful and also having different kinds of expectations that may be harmful or hurting them. So I teach them how, how to reprogram their thinking. And I call this Happiness 101. Right? So it's a basic lesson in happiness, happiness 101. And I remind them that there are three things that lead to happiness. And uh, it's actually quite a coincidence uh, today. You know, I sent Bobby several photographs of the prison work and asked him to choose whatever he wants to put in the poster. And it so happened he chose this one. And this was exactly the moment where I taught them three things lead to happiness. And then this morning, without thinking, I just went to my wardrobe, I just picked up one shirt and put it on. Guess what? <laughs> Same shirt. <laughs> it, it wasn't intentional. It so happened this was a shirt I just wore briefly the other day. I thought, okay, I always like to you know, wear shirt until it's time to wash them. So I just took the one that I wore briefly the other day and put it on. And then on my way here, then I was thinking about this, then I realized, so, oops, same shirt. <laughs> so three things lead to happiness. And what are they? And this is teach them how to reprogram their thinking so they can recover from the emotional disturbances. First is to learn to forgive the past. Okay, Forgive the past because in the, they come from a life where the past is filled with all kinds of hurt and regrets. So learn to forgive. And then, not only that, they must learn to look around and realize that there's a lot of blessings in life. Learn to be grateful for the present. So we're dealing with the past, we're dealing with the present, and then we, to deal with the future, if you want a happy life in the future, do good, think good, feel good, kindness towards the future. So basically reminding them of the basic essence of karma. Of course, when I say karma, some of them understand and accept it, but there are some who do not so-called accept the word karma because they associate karma with Hinduism and Buddhism and then they reject it emotionally. Then I say to them, God is watching you. 
If you think good, feel good, do good, God will help you. Well, that worked. <laughs> That's karma. Actually, uh, this is interesting for, for many of us who don't believe in Creator God. And when people talk about God, 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 you just think of God as karma. That's it. Right? So I get them to remind themselves. So the important thing is forgiveness is the hardest to do. I mean, gratitude and kindness is not so difficult. Forgiveness is hard because deep inside them, they are hurting, you know, they're angry, they are regretful, they, have this, they are despising somebody who hurt them. But I remind them, when you learn to forgive, you are helping yourself, free yourself from the hurt. So I remind them that there is this hurt that is hurting them in their heart. Learn to let it go. And the important thing I actually reminded them, it's not about the other person. I have to keep reminding them. The same with all of us. Forgiveness is not about the person who hurt you. Forgiveness is about the situation that happened. Forgive the situation. That's the easy way. Easy way. Forgiving a situation is much easier than forgiving a person. If someone hurt you, it's very hard to forgive that person. I mean, some people can do that, but it's really a very tough challenge. But if you experience hurt and harm for a moment in your life, for, for, uh, for an incident in your life, then forgive what happened. That's, what, that's how we get them to, to realize it. Forgive the situation. It's not about the people who hurt you. It's about loving yourself, caring for yourself, and learning to let go of the hurt in your heart. And by doing that, you learn to adapt and adapt to the new situation that they are now incarcerated in the prison. And the person who hurt them might be free out there, but learn to adapt and, and let go of the situation so that they are able to move forward with their life. So this was a very helpful way of explaining to them forgiveness. So what I do is to get them to do affirmation. So with each category, forgiveness, for instance, I get them to recite this together, right? Um, in the case of forgiveness, I ask them to open up their hands like that, you know, like as though you're offering forgiveness to the world. And then I get them to recite it together. I forgive myself for hurting myself out of anger, blah, blah, blah. So they recite that. At the end of reciting that, I actually again use laughter yoga to help to, to reprogram that, to help to reinforce the thought and get them to let it all out and spread to the world with laughter. Ha 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 all that. I'll show you at the end. Uh, you know, it's a very long one to do all the four parts. There are four parts. The first is forgiving the past. And then when it comes to gratitude, I say gratitude is a prayer. Right? It's a kind of blessing. Put your palm together like it's a prayer. So they will do that because they do that all the time when they want to pray to God. So this helps them. Put your palm together and then realize that life is a blessing. So be grateful. And then they recite this. Right? You can download the, the, I'll give you the link. You can download the file with all these words. You can actually use them yourself if you want. These are affirmations. And they are very, uh, very thoughtfully programmed so that it helps people reinforce in their mind, grateful for blessings that have brought them comfort, peace, and happiness, and so on. So that's that. Then when it comes to kindness, I ask them, where does kindness come from? And of course, from the heart. So now put both hands over the heart and recite this. So kindness towards the future, and they begin to recite this. Right? Now, this gratitude and kindness, these are, these are very important teachings. And it, of course, it also came from the Buddha. There is a, a sutra in Anguttara Nikaya, uh, Book of Two, verse 119, where the Buddha spoke about two kinds of people, very hard to come by. The first kind is people who are willing to do acts of kindness anytime when needed. They will partake in acts of kindness. That is... Uh, Pubakari. Pubakari is not just about loving kindness. It's actually the intention and the action of doing something kind. And then being grateful and thankful, right? Uh, great, 
Now, a lot of people say, oh, being grateful, being thankful, isn't it the same thing? Okay, a very, very subtle difference. Being grateful is something you feel inside. Being thankful is something you express outwards, right? You express, thank you. You don't express, you don't express grateful, no. You express, thank you. So, you are grateful inside, you thank people outside. That's why it's two separate words the Buddha said. So, it's uh, one who takes the initiative to help others. And then the second part is one who is grateful and thankful. Grateful is feeling it and realizing it. Thankful is expressing it and doing it. So this is really uh, a very powerful source of Dharma. That again, I didn't tell them about the Dharma, <laughs> transform into these um, affirmations. And finally, the last one is basically summarizing those three, the way to happiness. Right? So when we're no longer able to change the situation, we're challenged to change ourselves and so on. Offer your forgiveness to the world. Let's read it all together. I forgive myself for hurting myself out of anger, fear, frustration, or anxiety. I forgive others who have hurt me, harmed, or angered me. I forgive myself. Using laughter to reinforce the affirmation. They're simple techniques, but very powerful. 
I'm very fortunate to have come from a background where I'm able to use this kind of tools and learn how to adapt them to the situation. So basically all that are the first three. That is level one, right? That is two hours already. And then they will come back for another lesson another time, one week later or a few days later, we will do the level two, which is then focused on resilience. It's quite lengthy, but I won't go into the details of uh, the level two, basically. But I'll give you a summary. The level two, I basically get them to how to program the mind to become resilient. And there are five ways to change thinking. That means their mind is now disturbed by all kinds of bad thoughts, negative thoughts, evil thoughts, trying to take revenge on somebody who has hurt them and things like that. So how do we learn how to let go these bad thoughts and evil thoughts? So there are five ways. And being able to practice these five ways is what resilience is all about. And the first is that when the mind is disturbed by bad thoughts, then change the channel, like changing the channel on the TV. Focus on something else, something different. Take your mind, you know, you cannot take your mind away from the thought that is hurting you. But what you can do is now you place your mind to look at something else. So I get them to focus on other things, events and pleasant and peaceful things in their life, joyful memory, focus on those. So that's the first part. Now, if that doesn't work and they still have bad thoughts wanting to hurt the people who hurt them, then consider that there are consequences. Think of the harmful effects and harmfulness of bad thoughts when you want to harm other people. And if they still have difficulty letting go, then learn how to abandon these thoughts by doing meditation, to, not to focus on these thoughts. Take their focus away from it. Stop focusing on it and, uh, and stop focusing or reflecting on the bad thoughts. Learn to let it go by practicing mindfulness or breathing exercises, uh, meditations. And then do something relieving. You know, another way, if you can't overcome that, then do something relieving like sports, recreation, livelihood, activities. They have all kinds of livelihood programs, right? And finally, the last one is do tension relaxation exercises. As I mentioned, tension relaxation, there is a psychosomatic effect. When you flex your physical body, the brain becomes aware of it. But now you want to let go of these bad thoughts in your mind. So when you're flexing the physical body, your brain is also flexing the mind at the same time. This is the psychosomatic effect. The mind and the body are interconnected, inseparable. Even the Buddha has mentioned that. Give you an example. If you wake up one morning and then you have a headache and you feel the slight fever, so your body is not good. Are you able to concentrate on your work well? Can you do a good job? No, the rest of the, your day is more or less spoiled if all these physical things are disturbing you. So the body affects the mind. Turn it the other way around. You wake up one morning and it's a beautiful morning and the sun is out and you feel good. So your body is really good now. And then suddenly, I'm mentioning it to the, the inmates, suddenly they get a phone call from their home informing them a dearly beloved relative has just passed away. Now that is bad news, that's affecting the mind. Now if that is affecting the mind, are they able to function the rest of the day physically strong and energetic? No, oh, difficulty. So the mind affects the body. So this is the psychosomatic effect. Likewise, when you're flexing the body, you are also, you unconsciously, your brain is also flexing the mind. So if you really want to let go bad thoughts, flex the body and then focusing on, ah, well, never mind. And when that happens, you're able to release these bad thoughts from your mind. Those of you who have been doing a lot of sutra study, I think you would recognize this is one of the sutra, Majjhima Nikaya 20, Vitaka Santana Sutra. And I use Pandipunaji's translations. So again, uh, taking sutra, turning it into exercises and lessons to help them program and, and reinforce good thoughts in their mind this is really what this program is all about. So the second part is quite lengthy, a lot of exercises involving these five stages 
of uh, five stages of clearing the mind from bad thoughts. So basically, this is what mindfulness-based resilience is all about. Cultivating this mental toughness and agility so that they are able to recover quickly and adapt easily to traumatic experiences, adversities, and uncertainties. And this will help them cultivate resilience where they will then benefit. So instead of talking about what we are doing, we also tell them the benefit. And this is the benefit. We cultivate healthy body, peaceful mind, caring heart, motivated spirit. What, what else you want in life? What else is better than this in life? You know. So this is really the essence of what I was sharing with them. Basically, the Buddha Dharma is presented in a secular manner, coupled with four stages of exercises, relax, relieve, recover, resilience. And these become very powerful tools for reformation and rehabilitation of the incarcerated community. And with that, I end my sharing about this mindfulness-based resilience program for the incarcerated. May suffering once be suffering free. The fear struck, fearless be. May grieving ones shed all grief. May all beings find peace and relief. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. And you can download. There's a link there. You can download. Uh, okay. That's the link you can download. Uh, just take a snapshot. BGF, today's date, 2024-0609. And then uh, if you want... Pandit Puniji's translations, those, those two sutras are at the end of that book. His meditation guide, uh, Arya Maga Bhavana 1, where at the end he had his translation of Veda Vitaka Sutra, Majjhima Nikaya 19, and the Vitaka Santana Sutra, Majjhima Nikaya 20, at the end of the book. And if you have any questions, please, uh, you can ask them now, or you can send me email if you have other questions after that. Uh, feel free to drop me an email if you have something you wanted to ask about. So with that, I end my presentation.